Hi Nancy. We're here in the history room and we want to know a little bit about it. And the first question I have for you is what's the difference between a historian and an archive? Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of people really are not aware that there's even a difference at all. But a historian is somebody that really studies the history and past history, current history, and usually has great knowledge of that. Where a archivist is one that stores the records and takes care of them, tries to preserve them for the future. And they try to learn about how to preserve records so that they don't deteriorate. And so that if a historian comes along and wants to study them, as you can see here in the room today, this is what I've done for the last eight years, along with a lot of help, of course. But um, we've taken all the old records that were piled up and figured out a system that we thought the average person would be able to access and use. And that's really my motivation for it, because I'm hoping that somewhere down the road somebody like some young man or some young lady will come back and maybe want to research something that happened to them when they were going to church here or their parents or grandparents and hopefully that information will be in these books. There's current use of these books um, that an archivist puts together because a lot of times a committee in a church, maybe let's take the trustee committee, may be talking and discussing an issue and they'll say, one of the committee members might say, well, I think we voted on that some time ago. Well, if you keep the records of the minutes in an easily accessible place, they can come in and look at the trustee files and because then those are chronologically in order, they can look up a past vote they did or what they decided to do. And that's why getting the minutes from the chair people of our church is so important because then those go into the permanent record. But really my main motivation was just kind of thinking of the future and the fact that how much fun it is to get in a book like Vera was telling the other day that she came down here for a minute and wound up for a long time. And that's what happens when you're the archivist. You get into, um, you know, you're sto supposed to be filing things and the next thing you know you're reading things. So an archivist does know a lot about the church and its history. Sometimes because of the years that they've served or been in that church, or sometimes just from reading the papers that they're filing. So a lot of times they, they are almost historians. <laughs> but does that answer your question, Vera? Yes, yes. And then I'd like to know, you know, this room is kind of a well-kept secret, and yet we call it the history room. How did this come about, and what year was that that we started it? Mm -hmm. It was about, I had just retired and just closed a store that I had, and they came to me and asked me, would I like to be the historian? And I said, well, what's involved? And no one really could tell me anything. And I said, well, what are, where are the records up to this point? Because this would have been in about 19, let's see, six, this would have been about nine, or, um, 2008. Okay. And they said, well, really, there aren't any formal records anywhere. There's just boxes. And so when you talk about, people will say to me, how did you ever do all this or anything? I say, well, nothing you do in church is by yourself. There's always people before you and people after you. And so a lot of people before me had saved a lot of paperwork. We had a secretary who was had been our secretary for about 17 years. And I remember she took a little grief about all the boxes of, you know, paper she was saving and it got moved around and had to be stored. But I thank her every time, not every time I see her, but close. Her name is Laverne Swinehart. Because without her, we wouldn't have a lot of the records that we do have in this uh, archive right now. 
So finally I said, well, where would I find these records? Well, they're just kind of scattered all over the church, <laughs> was the story I was told. And so I started doing a little snooping in the church and I found boxes of things kind of everywhere. And, just, and I said, well, the first thing I'd have to do is go through and kind of clean up the messes and, and find the boxes of things that a you know, historian, because they were calling it a historian, would use. And so I um, engaged the services of my son, who was about 30 at the time, to help me clean in the church and help me. Well, we wound up with lots of banker boxes. I can't remember now, somewhere around 20 to 30 banker boxes. And I really didn't have any place to work at the time. We didn't have this room. But I said, well, I need a place to work. You know, I can't be picking up things. You know, every time you get them spread out on a table, because remember, all these papers were in boxes and they had to be sorted into categories. And I said, we really need a place to work. And it just happened that this little house right in back of the church was and had been our parsonage for a youth leader and it was now available. So we moved everything over there, had to do some cleaning again in order to use that. And we got to use it about a year. We even did some painting and really cleaned things up. And by then, I had a friend who'd come along to really help me with the project of going through all these papers. And her name was Betty Witcher. And she was really invaluable to me because she never complained. Other people would come along and once in a while give me a few minutes here or there. And they would, they'd have opinions about whether you should keep something. And at that stage, I didn't even know if we should keep things. It was a process, you know, I was learning along with everybody else. But she was always willing, you know, she'd say, you just tell me what to do and what to say. So she and I worked together for eight years. And we came once a week, or together we met once a week. And um, we worked about anywhere from three to five hours once a week on these papers because every single page had to be looked at. You couldn't throw anything away and you had to check that you didn't already have it. So it, that's why it was such a long drawn out process. But we just got nicely going and had started our notebooks to file these papers in. I'd set up a system and we need they needed the house again for a new youth pastor. So I said, well, we're still, they said, aren't you through yet? It's been about a year. <laughs> the trustees, aren't you through yet? My husband's a trustee, so <laughs> I said, no, we're not through. We're nowhere near through. So where can we meet? And so they debated back and forth, and they finally decided that this room that we're in, what did this room used to be called, Vera? The Albright Room? It's the, no, Albright Room is upstairs. Yeah. This was uh, Claude Good's classroom. Yeah, but there's another, somewhere along the line, it got another It room. had a name. Okay. Uh, it had a name, and right now that, See, that's the history part of me that's escaped. But we started meeting in this room, and the only thing we had were we put up folding tables to put our materials out on. We had two long folding tables in this room, and we put one had the boxes, and the other had all this loose material that we tried to figure out every time we met what to do with. Sometimes we actually met more than once a week. but. Um, in the meantime, we just kind of kept working and working, and then we decided finally, the trustees, that they were going to make this the permanent history room. Mm -hmm. But it it had been it neglected for a very long time. I mean, you know, there was no, had been nothing done down here. And because I had closed my store in these old oak cabinets I had had in my store, they were original apothecary cabinets from the late 1800s and I said my, to my husband and I decided that if the church wanted them that they would make good bookshelves instead of just going out and buying something at 
Lowe's or Home Depot, you know, just your standard old garage type of work bookshelves. So that was another endeavor was to get these moved here because they're 26 feet of cabinets. When they used to be in my store, they were all together in one unit and they were very nice, but here we couldn't, of course, do that. So after some painting and things like that, and then we had someone volunteer this table, one of our members, so we were able to take out, you know, the folding tables. And, and then as we started getting these files together, we just had stickers on them in the beginning. We didn't have them labeled or anything. But we, we at least had something to put them into instead of just leaned up on a table and falling apart. And so um, this became the formal uh, history room or archive room. I don't know what will happen one of these days because there's probably a chance that as time goes on, it won't be big enough. You know, they'll need more space to put more files, but, uh, and it's used sometimes mm -hmm. as a classroom. I mean, there's no reason. I love the thought of being down here with all these saints because <laughs> all these, I think of them as saints, the people that contributed everything to this and also the years that preceded us that those records were kept and we were able to mm -hmm. have them because that, that just doesn't happen very often. And Nancy, am I wrong, or were a lot of these records just down in the old boiler room? Yes. Just sitting there. Yep. Yeah. Heaven forbid they get wet yep. or oh, they were. Musty. And they were just kind of scattered all around the church. Mm -hmm. There are still some records in the boiler room that I've not had the chance to sit down and go through because the they're, they're not anything like this. They're just old uh, ledger books. The writing is very f faded and... Attendance it, records. Yes, yeah. attendance yeah. records. And there might be some record keeping in there that would answer some of the questions that come up for history once in a while. And that's my goal next, is to be able to get into those and really go through those page by page and see what we could do because their handwriting was was very um, Edwardian looking, you know, very fancy with lots mm -hmm. of, and it's somewhat faded. So it's not something I can just sit down and look at easily and read. You know, it takes concentration. So you almost have to take a page at a time and read what they had to say and go from there. But I, I'm anxious to do that because there <coughs> might be these would have all been before 1900, and so I'd like to do that. See, actually, the Methodists started here in Vicksburg in 1830, but it took them 40, or 1840, but it took them 30 years to build the first building, mm -hmm. which is our sanctuary upstairs. Before that, they were served by uh, sometimes pastors, but a lot of times they were served by, if you look at that circuit, circuit rider poster over there, the circuit riders would just go from settlement to settlement to settlement, and eventually people started, you know, not just Methodists, but other other denominations were meeting in homes and, and um, libraries, any place they could find, basically, to hold 20 or 30 people. And then eventually, when the church was built, the building upstairs, which was just one square, that's all it was, is one square, and, uh, or a rectangle, actually. It was a small rectangle. And that was all. That was it. And it stayed that way for about 20 years before we started adding things like the bell tower. And not we. That was before Vera in my time. You know, we... Um, but that was all before the 1900s. So there's still a little digging to do, but yeah. it's going to take maybe somebody with really good eyesight and patience <laughs> to do the next leg of it. Well, and it certainly is a unique room because I'm just finding that out. I've watched Nancy do this for the last many, many years, and it's not my thing because if I'm going to do something, I want it done an hour from now, not <laughs> eight years from now. And 
if you look in this cabinet, every single member of this church has a file. It may have your wedding picture in it, or your obituary, or <laughs> births announcements, or some award you won, or something, but every member has a file in these two cabinets. Not too many churches care that much about their members, I don't think. I just think that's really unique. That was important to me, was yeah, to have that. I think that's great. Because that would be what somebody in the future might come back and want to research. Is you know, And we have had some calls from great-grandchildren of some of the past mm -hmm. pastors, and we don't have anything to offer them at this point. But I'm mm -hmm. hoping those ledgers... Mm -hmm. that are still in that boiler room. I've left them there and they're in a good filing cabinet and they're, they're nice and warm. <laughs> there is yeah. not any moisture in there and so I'm hoping that, they, that that's the best place for them until we can get them out and get them in, you know, like sleeves that won't deteriorate mm -hmm. the pages further. So, Nancy, help us understand the cataloging yeah. for all of these books. That, what do we do if we're looking for something? Yeah. When I started, I didn't have any, because I didn't really know anything about Dewey Decimal System or anything, and I didn't think that a lot of our members would know about Dewey Decimal System. And going down the road, I was really wasn't sure that they would. Well, the millennials won't know about no, Dewey Decimal no. Systems. So I thought, well, what can we do to put it so it's in some sort of order? And I have to admit that I pretty much copied what the uh, Historical Society has done because I went down there in the early stages to talk to them before we ever started, Betty and I ever really started. And I asked them, you know, how do you put your books together and everything? Well, I've actually, I went in looking for something on Methodist Church pictures or something and they did have a few things and then they said well you know there's a there's a book too that has that and by a book it's a notebook you know just like I have here and um, I don't know if they have quite the same system that we do but it's very similar after we got all of these notebooks put together um, you know the next job was to put them into categories and label them. So like on the table, anybody can come in here anytime and Vera, hold that up or maybe pass it down to me so I can hold it. Up. We made an index, a written index, and in this index is there, every notebook we have in here is listed on these pages. So if you were interested in trustees, for instance, you were um, wanting to know if my husband come in and he wanted to look up something about trustees, he would go down this until he found the trustee category and then it tells him exactly what books to go to. So anybody can use these for anything. Uh, we have books on the past pastors, we have books on the youth groups. Well, you can see we have lots of books and lots of photos. I've never really counted up the books. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> but even in our photo books, we have church celebration, administrative committees, Bible studies, prayer groups, vacation Bible school, fundraiser. It goes on and on, you know. So no matter what you're looking for, they're on, they're on this list. So you can find them. And then, as Vera said before, we have those files in back of her over there that tell our files for individual members the best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it should be fairly easy. Did you have any trouble finding what you were looking for? No, I used, I used that chart. Mm -hmm. I was looking for things way back to begin with. Well, then I was looking for things on ministers and mm -hmm. pictures and things, and I was able to easily mm -hmm. find them. I know I have had to come down and use these drawers to hopefully find baptism certificates mm -hmm. or marriage certificates for people from wherever that needed a date. And mm -hmm. so one time I had to go to the boiler room and do that. <laughs> now I don't have to. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, and we do have books and baptisms. And that's the other thing, you know, not all secretaries over the years 
secretaries of the church. Sometimes we wouldn't even have had a secretary. But even when we did, some of them weren't as fastidious about keeping all the records as Laverne Swinehart was. She kept everything, <laughs> you know. And then uh, our, past, our last pastor we had that had been with us since about 2000, was here 17 years, he kept everything. So when he left and retired, he brought all his records to us too. In fact, there's still a pile over there I haven't filed. Because even though I know I probably already have what he's given me, I still have to check, just in mm -hmm. case. I don't want to throw away a paper that we don't have, you know, that we might need. So, uh, like Vera asked me this afternoon, mm -hmm. do you have these? And I said, I think so, but I'll have to check, you know, right. because... So it means going to that file that carries that, that information and checking to see if you already have it. I keep very... Mostly try to keep only one copy of everything. Because if you look at all the books we already have, it would be pretty hard to start doubling up on copies right. and everything. That's why it would be, I'd love it if somebody down the road would maybe do a project where they would do a, um, a computer file for us. So mm -hmm. then we'd have it another safeguard. Because mm -hmm. if there was a fire, it would be gone. Right. Right. No. And that will be the way of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, Nance, you and Betty have just done something I could never do because, like I say, you are disciplined and you've put years and years and years into this, and it's just precious. I really don't know any other church that has something this unique. I almost wish we could have a history room class and come down and just take a book a week and talk about it. Oh, that would be nice. Wouldn't that would that be, be fun? something. I'd love Wouldn't it if fun? more people did yeah. use the room and started so. coming down because I never wanted, you know, there was talk in the beginning, well, we'll keep the room locked. And I said, Damn. not while I'm here. Right. <laughs> I want it to no. be available to people, mm -hmm. you know. And they said, well, then what if something disappears? Which it will, I'm sure. You know, someday somebody, not intentionally, but somebody will come in and want this and take it home with them and then just forget to ever bring it bring back. It, and, it, yeah. and that will happen. But yeah. there's lots of other records that never made it to this right. destination. So, um, But yet the, bet, I mean, the reason you do all this is so people can have use of it. So I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. make it that they had to call me every time they wanted to come down here. Right. Mm -hmm. And the church will never be able to pay you for all your time and energy you put into it, but I fully realize you put your heart into it. Yeah, we and did. didn't expect that, but we, we do appreciate it. Well, I know yeah. you do, and I'm, I'm very grateful that it's now the bulk of it, I have to say, I'm kind of glad it's behind me. You know, you might not always sign up for everything if you knew it was going to take <laughs> I was thinking we were going to breeze through this. I didn't realize right. what was involved. But nevertheless, uh, Betty and I have had many good hours down here. And people stopped in, like Vera, she'd sometimes stop in for mm -hmm. an hour or two. Betty's sister made all the labels for these books for us. She's oh. really good at doing that. And she made them and even put, put them in. You know, I'd give her a list and she would type and bring them in. So every time we add one, I call her now because I'm... At this point, I want them all to be the same, yeah. but thank you. Is yeah. there, does that kind of answer your questions? I think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. These cabinets don't really contain any of the historical material necessarily. Well, they still are historical materials, but some of them are artifacts from years back or something like this baseball trophy that a 1925 team from... Um, the church here won that trophy. There's some bowling trophies, things like that, you know, just little mementos and that sort of thing. Old Bibles, some of the Bible, one of the Bibles is from a pastor that served here in the 1940s, and that was his personal Bible. So these cabinets have more or less um, just some artifacts. Over here in this cabinet, we were glad to get these there because we don't have the... Um, EUB, the Evangelical United Brethren Church, and the Methodist Church here in Vicksburg um, melded and blended together to form the United Methodist Church in 1968. 
And this, these are a few artifacts from then, um, which we just don't have much from the EUB church. Apparently, uh, it, it wasn't considered of prime importance or something. I don't know, but they didn't save a lot of their written materials. These are the books that we talk about that you can come in at any time and look up about anything you want off of the, uh, the chart that shows you the details of them and so on. And each book has a, a letter of the alphabet and also has a number. So they're very easy to find. And the, the biggest trouble you'll have using this library is that as you get started, you get involved in reading and you don't want to stop. That, that's the hard part about doing the archiving, too. So as we move on around, these are just more of the books. I've never really counted them up. Um, anytime you want to look up photos, these books right here with the green tabs on them are all photo books. And we labeled them with the people's names the best we could. Uh, sometimes we didn't know who they were, so we weren't able to do them. Throughout the church, we have a lot of wall hangings and pictures and artwork and that sort of thing. And uh, items that have been donated to the church by different members over the years and that's what you're seeing here now. This one right here is kind of interesting. Uh, when we decided, when this was given to us to be the history or archive room, that entire wall over there was, was had these handprints on it. One of the kids classes had done those once. And we hated to, you know, we got permission, first of all, was it okay to paint that wall and paint over those hands? So I took photos of them, and that's what we have here is what the photos were. So we, and it's just called hand prints, and then it tells what it was. But um, these are kind of interesting. These were actually made at some point as offering baskets during the church service. So the ushers would come along and put those down the rows like this, you know, kind of hand them down the rows. And uh, if you were dozing or sleeping, they would turn it around and give you a little nudge with this. <laughs> I love that. And uh, the clock up there, that was donated to us by uh, a couple that were longtime members of this church, um, Dale and, uh, oh, mercy, forgot her name, um, Dale Beal. But anyway, they, he made that clock, and uh, so there's just lots of that. As you come here, this blackboard, for instance, I found at a, an antique store and thought it was appropriate for this room. This uh, picture here is done by one of our members. It's some local art, you know, that somebody did and I found it in all the paperwork and I thought, oh, that should be framed. And so we'll find that as we go along. The circuit rider, of course, is very predominant in Methodist, um, the Methodist denomination. In the early years, that's how the, the preachers wrote, were on their horsebacks to uh, spread the news of God's gospel and so on. And this table here, this was donated to us by a couple that were, they've been members of our church for a long time and they thought it would make a nice table uh, for us to work on and it's proven invaluable. Um, that was, uh, oh see now I can't remember their names. I do know it, but Brad and Sandy, Brad and Sandy, that part I know and maybe, maybe somebody else will remember their last name. The rug here, I negotiated with a, with a antique rug gentleman up there on Millam Drive in Portage because I kept, I wanted a rug in here because sometimes this room is very cold and so working in here in the winter we needed that warmth for our feet. And as I set out looking, I couldn't find anything in a new rug that was really appropriate. So I finally ventured in there, and he was um, he was very nice to me because they carry rugs in there in the $30,000 bracket, which wasn't in my pocketbook. But 
uh, anyway, he wound up giving me the church a, a very nice discount on this rug, and it, it fits the room and fits the history of the, the church. The wall that had those handprints were all over this wall right here. This whole wall was nothing but handprints. And my husband and some other guys happened to be the ones that were trying to, you know, get rid of the handprints so we could paint the room. And I come down here one Saturday, and he and two or three other guys were down here sanding. And they were as blue, I told them they were like the blue men of the blue men band, you know, because they were covered and head to toe with blue paint because of that picture, or that wall had a lot of blue paint on it. So in sanding it, you couldn't just paint over it. You had to sand it down to get the little ridges out and everything. But anyway, it's a conglomerate, just like all things in churches. It's, you know, lots of things have been given by lots of people, not only their time, but their uh, treasures too. So thank you. Our historic tile wall that was started like 15 years ago by our secretary, Trish Van Tickle. And she started it as a fundraiser to pay off the Family Life Center. People play, paid $50 a tile for a memory or an honor or a wedding or a birthday. We have a list of our ministers going clear back to 1966. It's not quite current, we need to fill in some more. And then people just would sign up and give us their idea. And several lovely ladies over the last 15 years have gone to the Art Bayou shop where these are painted on raw tile and then fired. And, and Nancy and JR finally put the grout in and we are to this point, but we can go a little further, and if we have to, we can take down a coat rack and keep going. It's just an ongoing history of the people who go through this church. And our oldest living member is missing. Yeah. So um, many dear old ones here, LeVon and Dio Beal, they've been gone for a long time. What's the name I couldn't think um the um all of these have anniversaries here. from daughters of Ron and Folk mm -hmm. Hayward. Uh Ruth Appel was a loving, wonderful member. Dr. Millard Roberts did our stained glass windows and our lamp up in the narthex. Who else? Bob and Betty Braceman. I can tell you a cute story about Bob. Bob and Betty were members of the EUB church, and Bob was known to my kids as the candy man. We probably wouldn't let him be a candy man nowadays, but when my kids got to church, they knew they could get a hug and candy from Bob. And if in the middle of the service it got to be a little too long, Bob would give them more candy. And they were very musical, very, very talented people. Claire Carvel and Ethel. Say something about them. Well, he was the postmaster here in Vicksburg, right. and they were very, again, very longtime members and just really good servants of Christ. And the, this group of tiles right here, there's about a hundred of them. And Vera and I decided that, you know, we just kept thinking about people that had been already passed away for a long time and they didn't have anybody still in the church that were part of their family that might do a tile for them, you know, as just a little nice token. And we just couldn't stand the thought of that. So one day she and I down in the history room went through all our old membership books and between the two of us, we come up with about a hundred names in since about 1950 that there wouldn't be anybody, but yet we remembered them and knew how much they contributed. So she and I started giving money to the Memorial Club, and then we talked them into letting us do these tiles, not at a cost of $50, but at the basic cost of what it cost us to do them. Mm -hmm. And that way we were able to cover about 100 people right. Right. that 
wouldn't have had anybody, and yet they're so instrumental in the, the progression of the church and all. I call them the saints. Here's a very special one I want to tell you about. It's called yeah. Doris and Lee Wake. They own the Doris Lee Sweet Shop in Vicksburg in the 50s, early 60s, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At yeah. least 20 or 30 years. Um, it was a sweet shop. We, as teenagers, Nancy and I, as teenagers, if you can imagine that, went there after school with our boyfriends and had <laughs> sodas and green rivers uh -huh. and things that you would have to ask questions about. Anyways, Doris and Lee never had any children of their own and they were very vital in the community of Vicksburg and boys had paper routes out of Lee's store and he oversaw all that and Doris shopped in Chicago for pretty glass that women could buy and then there was always the sweets. Well now we have a scholarship fund at our church and every year we give 15 to 20 high school students college scholarships from the interest off of their money that they donated for scholarships for kids. It touches my heart because mm -hmm. I knew them well and they would let us hold hands in the shop but that's as far as it went. You couldn't do anything <laughs> else. So they're very special to our church and um, Marge and Ray Valley. Marge was our choir director, Ray was a trustee and oh they were just so much fun. We would have some of the most fun times with Marge and Ray on their farm. They had a veal farm out off of S Avenue and we'd have Christmas parties and hay rides and things out there. And one more I wanted to point out was um, it's hard not to talk. About hard not to talk, but I saw Nina Cripsis. Where do I see Nina's? Nina Nina, 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 Nina. Anyways, Nina was was truly a server, a Martha. She helped people. She was the key person in delivering meals to sick people, and she was just very special. Her children and Bob grew up. Bob was a janitor here at one time, and he was also a science teacher at the high school. Um, so just. For me, this is lots of memories, lots of people I knew that people your age won't know, but you probably could find something about them down in the history room. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to finish it up. We'd like to finish that little section and maybe take down a coat rack and go that way. And we're hoping to do that. And the funds that go from this go to pay for the Family Life Center. The mortgage. The mortgage. Mm -hmm. The mortgage on the Family Life Center. Yeah. It's when you know all these people and you look at the wall, it's it's